My guest today is Kevin Gates. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing wonderful today. Thank you for having me. I'm doing wonderful as well. I'm glad you're here. Yes. Um, tell me, what do you do? I work as a cloud solution architect at Microsoft, and I help our customers build applications using the Azure cloud. So I'm going to guess that a cloud solution architect does a lot of architecture. Yes, yes. And and I, <laughs> which is a word that has always confused me, because I, maybe you agree with this. It means different things to different people. Of course, yeah. and. Uh, it could be for some people very nuanced, or it could be you know more large and enterprise in nature. Let's talk about what you do. What, what's um, when you do architecture? What do you mean by architecture? For me, that means helping customers understand what are the pieces they have today, and how can they bring in new technologies that uh, we are offering in the cloud, and how to make those things work interchangeably. Um, so when people have an application that may exist today, they may mm -hmm. say, hey, we want to go to Azure, but we don't know how to make those pieces fit with the technologies that Microsoft has to offer. And so we use visual tools like this and discussions to help customers understand what is that actual roadmap. Okay. Is that typical uh, that they have something already and they just want to migrate it? Or is it more typical that they have nothing but an idea and they want to build something new? We see both. And so some people have an existing application, like a sample one that we have here that they want to migrate. And then some are doing a greenfield kind of deployment. So so they say, how do we best align to the way people are building applications today instead of doing it the way they used to do it 10 years ago and then updating it? Oh, that's an interesting concept. So what worked, I think you've done some homework here already. You've got a, uh, some components that are presumably on-premises, and the way they work on-premises might be just perfect for on-premises, but if you move to the cloud, uh, maybe it's not perfect. Exactly, and there's some things to tweak, and we'll actually talk about what are some of these different pieces that you would need to, to change. Uh, let's talk about Let's dive into this right here and show me what you've got. Yes. I'm going to zoom in real quick. Yeah, sounds good. So here you can see I have a, uh, a fairly standard three or four tier application. So we have a web tier that does presentation in the front end. We have an API or business logic uh, tier of the application. This one is uh, your classic monolith, so it's large, it has different components that are Java and .NET, a lot of things that have been built up over the years. Um, here we have a database that is a SQL database, it's also doing backup and then it's also serving as a file server. And then most applic applications have some back-end work or things that need to happen, uh, such as logging, tracking of analytics. Uh, this thing may be doing some backups for the application or any kind of reporting against the database. Um, and so these are four common pieces. And instead of developing a strategy that enc encapsulates microservices or containers or serverless for the entire architecture. I think what I've been doing with partners is having sessions like this where we draw out the application and for each tier, we decide what is the best strategy to move it to the cloud. And so for this one, uh, this is a, you know, as we mentioned, a large application. This might make sense to use a microservices approach. Uh, here, this will be more of a lift and shift where we just move this database into platform as a service. And then this here would be a great candidate for moving some of these processes into a serverless architecture. So it's usually helpful to talk about the different tiers and what is the right strategy to move across for those pieces. So if I were to start, I figure that you know, we can start with the API server. And as we, you know, a lot of companies have this middle tier of their application that is large, it has a lot of complex logic, but the pain that they're seeing is when they're deploying this application today, they have to deploy all four of these in one shot. And a lot of people are moving towards building more agile applications, loosely coupled. And so we want to get to the point where we can ship just the API portion of the application, but even so, the, the smaller subcomponents, the smaller services that make up this API. And so th some of these are .NET, some of these are Java. And one of the first things that we work with customers to understand is what are the individual pieces of this large application and how can we break these out into smaller pieces? And so, Sometimes this starts to get quickly into topics like domain-driven design, where we are working with them to understand, hey, our, how are you aligning your development teams to the different technologies that you have in your application? 
Can you define domain-driven design? Domain-driven design is a concept that says, hey, your application, or for this example, uh, if this is a, a front-end store, a web store, there are some components of the application that could be doing things like printing. This is doing the shopping cart. This might be managing uh, sales, and this could be managing inventory. These are four separate domains or parts of the application, and we work with customers to help them understand if you have a development team that is building this, then this will essentially be one domain with a certain set of developers working on just that part of the application. Here you will have another domain with a separate responsibility and, and line in the sand effectively. So the domain driven design really refers to a separation of concerns, not only of the components, but of the people working on those components. Exactly, okay. and it's important to have that laid out so that when you want to start moving faster, instead of shipping this whole piece, if you have the lines drawn very clearly, then each of these teams are able to ship their code much faster uh, because we have outlined the dependencies and the things that need to happen all in one shot. And so we've taken this uh, API or this large service that used to be one executable that we would ship out and we've broken it, broken it out into smaller components and then we have separate developer teams that are now building out these portions of the application and then doing development tests and, and things like that. Now today this is shipped on a single virtual machine, but the idea is to get to the point where we can ship this out in smaller services. And so we've so far have embraced microservices at this tier because we've broken out this large application into these smaller services that can now be shipped independently. If I um, take this, then what I can do is figure out how do I uh, deploy this so that it scales automatically. And one of the benefits that we have here is now that I have these in microservices, um, containers are a popular technology that people are talking about now. And, and the idea behind containers is instead of grabbing the entire virtual machine, the operating system, the operating system files, et cetera, we are only grabbing the application and then we're grabbing any kind of runtime components or libraries or things like that. And then we wrap that up into a container image. And then from there, we're just shipping out that smaller image, which is usually in the megabytes instead of the gigabytes that you would see with a virtual machine. And so now we have this smaller image that we can then deploy and scale out into many more instances. So the idea is I would take each one of these uh, domains or parts of the application and then create a uh, container for each of these. And then we have technologies that we've been adopting such as Kubernetes, uh, which we have a service called Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes Service, which allows you to deploy your application across a set of nodes inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So the idea is I would have a Kubernetes cluster defined with one, two, three nodes, and then on each of those nodes, I would tell Kubernetes to deploy, in this example, maybe four instances of um, my inventory app. I may say, hey, I need three instances of this, four of this, and then two of that. And Kubernetes will automatically disperse the application across the cluster uh, and balance it out so that if this one component starts to get much more stressed, a lot of people doing inventory lookups, then Kubernetes will increase this to five or to 10 and, incre and uh, increase that portion, increase the compute and replicas of just that portion of the application. So you start to have an application that is able to uh, very fluidly expand and, and contract based on what part of the application is being used. That's very cool. So this is not only auto scaling, but it's auto scaling the pieces of the application that need to be auto scaled without increasing the, the, the capacity of ones that, that don't have a high demand. 
Correct. saving money. Yes, yeah, and that's you know some of the challenges that people have with virtual machines today is they increase the number of virtual machines running, but you're also increasing the overhead and all the other um, things that you're increasing the management and all those things get much more complex over time. Very cool. Let's talk about some of these other pieces here. I think that the API was probably the most complex. Is that fair to say? Uh, I would in agree. In terms of re-architecting. Yep. And so here we've, uh, you know, we've broken out our monolith. We've broken it into smaller services. We've aligned our teams to those services. We've then containerized the application because it's an easy way of shipping that code and and having it run inside of production. And then now this is our production environment. Our application is running. And as our teams update the application, there, um, we have a nice DevOps pipeline set up so that if this developer updates the code, then it goes through all the tests and validation that's required and then lands in production in a very automated fashion. So we've innovated on the API layer there's some other areas of the application that we can also innovate. For example, we have our database. And a lot of customers are looking to get out of the database management world. Um, it's just one of those things that you can leverage as a platform, as a service um, type thing. So here we have a few options inside of Azure. We have uh, Azure SQL database which is a database as a service. You give us a database, we run it, and um, give you the management console so that you can do that, but you don't have to manage the underlying operating system. Um, you could continue to run this as a virtual machine. So we have some customers that, says, uh, that say, hey, you know what, I really need to have tight control or there are certain things that I am used to doing that I need to make sure I'm still doing in the future. So you could continue to run SQL in a virtual machine. This would be considered infrastructure as a service. This would be considered platform as a service. And then we also have something that's a little bit in between and that's called SQL managed instance. And the idea behind managed instance is we run the operating system for you. We give you SQL in a VM we run the operating system for you and then we give you the full SQL console so that you can have all the control that you would have here with the simplicity of just man, uh, just interfacing with the SQL, um, the SQL console like you're used to in the older days. And so this is a, an in-between that we have a number of partners and customers looking at, at doing that. For the sake of this application, the platform as a service option is the best one where we still have control. Um, here you can see that backups is also important for us. And so we, the backups are handled automatically by our platform. And I can revert back. We support things like uh, transparent data encryption uh, and all the other kind of security things that you would expect. So that will take care of our database. Uh, and obviously we would have to update our connection strings inside of our application here to point to that new database and then we will be running inside the cloud with the database. Here we can see that this application is also being used as a, uh, had a need for files and we were uh, doing some file shares on this database server here. One of the other services we have is called Azure Files. And this allows you to set up a file share in the cloud and uh, still have your application talk to that file share that's sitting inside of Azure. One of the reasons I like this application you've drawn up here is that uh, it doesn't require a lot of changes to anything that's accessing the database or accessing the files. You're, if you're using SQL Server on-premises and you switch to uh, SQL, Azure SQL database, the connection string typically is the one thing you that do. you need to change. Yes, uh, the file locations you have to change to point to where the new files are. Uh, other than that, the file API should just uh, well, actually, I don't know that if you're using Azure, uh, the file API is the same. Yes, so SMB 3.0 is something that we're using okay. across. Uh, I have a partner that needed something very similar because the application here was hard coded to use UNC paths, yep. file share paths. 
So for them, they did not want to do a lot of code changes, and so we brought them over to Azure Files. We do have another way of storing files in Azure, and that um, for how a lot of people are using is it's blob storage. Oh, okay. And so and if that would use a REST service instead, so you would have correct. to change your client. So though. there would have to be some code changes, and depending on the appetite for the you know person who or for the people working on migrating this app, there could be some benefit in moving over to blob storage. But in terms of speed and in terms of getting it in the cloud, they um, in this scenario we're just going to go with the file share in the cloud. All right, very cool. And then over here we have some cross-cutting concerns like logging and analytics and things like that. Correct. Uh, is there a, is there kind of a turnkey way of doing this, or is there is it all custom? Uh, we have a, a good turnkey way of doing it. So one of the things that we offer as a part of the Azure platform is a technology called um, Azure Monitor. And within that, we have a technology called Application Insights. And Application Insights is a way of, you know, Application Insights brings you this dashboard inside of Azure where you can see how your application is behaving. And of course, you would want to see metrics on how the database is working. You'd want to see metrics on how the front end is behaving or how your middle tier is scaling out. But you may also want to have metrics coming from inside of your code. And so if this is a retail store, I may want to track number of orders fulfilled. And I can log that and use a REST API to pump that data into Application Insights, and then it then renders it on the dashboard for me. So I can take Azure platform metrics along with custom metrics that I'm tracking inside my app that are you know things that are relevant to me and have all that land in one place so that I can see how my application is performing and then from there you can take actions on what needs to happen so if you get an alert you can have it run a script or call a webhook or call into your Azure DevOps instance or your whatever you're using for tracking and login issue for your developers to work on at a later point in time. So with Application Insights, that'll take care of logging and analytics for us. Backups is something that, uh, as I mentioned, the database, Azure SQL database, is taken care of for us. Uh, and then we have some other backup uh, capabilities that are just a part of a lot of our native services. So for example, we haven't talked about um, leveraging app service, but app service allows you to do backups. I mentioned backups here. And then of course we can have versions of our container images uh, stored so that if we roll out a bad version, we can revert back to the previous version of our application. And then reports will get delivered through the dashboard as well. And so a lot of this here, we are able to leverage some of the native capabilities of the Azure platform, but it's also a good opportunity where we can leverage any kind of serverless technologies for things that might be event driven. So an example of that could be, hey, a customer goes through the web store, they buy something, their order gets submitted and lands in a database, we can have in a task configured so that when a new order lands in a database, um, traditionally, we would generate a PDF and then email that PDF to someone, and that happens server side. Well, we can just call a couple of past services in Azure that says, hey, look, when you see something written to the database, then I want you to go um, query the database, create a file, drop that file into blob storage, and then email a link to the user so that they can retrieve that uh, receipt from their purchase. And so the idea is these are all just events that we're stitching together. And in this scenario, it really does make sense to go with a serverless type architecture um, for that receipt and reporting. Uh, interesting. Uh, now up here, the it seems like web should be the easiest thing. You have an on-premise on uh, web server hosting your web application, and we have uh, you know, our app services that are essentially just a web server in the cloud. Yes. Platform as a service. But you've, you've, you've got a clue here as to why it can be complicated. The word, you wrote the word stateful underneath stateful, that. Stateful, yes. And so state is always a challenge in the web. And 
Um, yeah, when I, if you look at some of my old web apps, you'll see a lot of things just thrown into session state. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm and, not proud of it, but it's out there. <laughs> uh, and, and that's very, very true. The idea is if you have, uh, if your application is stateful, that means that when it's running, it is remembering things about the users, the state of the application, what people have in their shopping cart, et cetera. And that works fine if you just have one instance of your web server, because when I hit next on the web page, I keep coming back here. But if my traffic goes over to a second server, if you increase the number of instances, then this second one will not know what was in your shopping cart. So you'll click next and you'll see that your shopping cart's empty. So that means that this application has state and the state is stored on the machine that is processing the request. So in this case, there will have to be some application changes to, to basically take that state and move it somewhere else. So we have a service in the cloud called Redis. Uh, it's based off of Redis Cache. And the idea is I take this state that I store, and instead of storing it on my machine, I do a network call to Redis, and I store that state external to the server so that whichever machine my traffic lands on, they both will come here to this external service to grab the state and continue working. So, uh, you know, this may, you know, we have a lot of customers that don't have stateful applications. So in that case, the Redis portion wouldn't be needed, but this is important if you want to start to scale this application out uh, and you, you're concerned about the user impact there. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we'll leverage App Service, which is Microsoft's web server in the cloud. It has all kinds of great features for doing dev test, versioning of your application, slicing out some of your production users and, and sending them to a test environment so that you can make sure that everything is ready to go once you flip over to the, your newer version. Um, this is very good. I, this is, of course, just one example of a sample application, but it looks a lot like a lot of applications I've done before. Yes. A yeah. web app talking to a database in the back end with some business logic in between, and uh, hopefully I'm doing some analytics and logging. Yes, <laughs> to, yeah. To, and there's to many other pieces we could fold into here. Um, one last question is, if I, if I want to migrate this from on-premise to the cloud, do I have to do all do it all at once, or um, that seems like a big challenge? Can I take pieces of it and migrate it a little at a time and and test them, make sure they work, or you know, if I have no, don't overload my developers? Yes, uh, very much something that you can do in a phased approach. So for some of our customers, you know, database might be the first thing that they move out into the cloud, and then as we mentioned before, you're just changing the connection string, and then it's going out to the cloud, and then you can start doing backups and reporting off of that cloud instance. Um, but depending on your strategy and what is most important, these are different pieces that you can move out separately and then still tie together. What are some guidelines to say, uh, what should I migrate first? You know, in a lot of ways, the compute, you know, the logic sometimes needs to be close to the data. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you want to... Uh, move those together at the same You time. might want to move those two pieces together, uh, or it could be you know, some of the logging and utility. You might move these pieces, so you would build out your serverless component for this, and then move these pieces together, and then do these at a later phase. Um, so it really does vary based on the, the application architecture. OK, that's excellent. Um, do you have an online presence? I do. Uh, I have a site, dreaddontdie.com, is where I do a lot of my development. I have photography, and then I've spent a lot of time with Azure Kubernetes service and doing containers, so I've been blogging my experiences and learnings on there. Excellent. Kevin, thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate you having me. I hope you enjoyed learning about technology with me and my friend Dave.